Most people have no idea how long eternity lasts. They think that this is such a concept as infinity. I know this is not true. Eternity for me lasted 15 years, 2 months, 27 days, and several strange hours. It ended much the same way it began, my wife Tracy lovingly looking into her partner's eyes before sharing a passionate kiss. The only difference, however, is that I was this partner for the first time, and the kiss came right after I asked her to be mine forever, the night I gave her the engagement ring. This time I was a mere bystander in a restaurant two towns away from where we live, as she and an apparently new lover gaze adoringly into each other's eyes, and then leaned in for the most passionate kiss. How I ended up in the same restaurant as this couple is irrelevant. From the fact that they were an hour away from our hometown, it was obvious that they were taking precautions to avoid being seen by anyone who knew them. My first reaction when I saw them was curiosity, then quickly turned to shock, disgust, and anger as the scene played out in front of me. I immediately thought about getting up and hitting her bow, but then again, I was always taught to never hit a woman, so I just sat there, completely stunned. Since they had eyes only for each other, and apparently felt safe that no one who knew them would see them, they took their time eating, playing the kissing game from time to time. I ate very slowly and had dessert, so I watched them as I ate. My feelings alternated between rage and helplessness. When they finished, they stood up, took each other's hands and left. I sat there in silent rage and felt like the biggest ignorant fool in the whole world. I was married to Tracy for over 14 years, and we were an exclusive couple for two years before that. But I never suspected she was bisexual. She never looked twice at another woman I've ever seen, and never gave me any hints in any conversation we've ever had. I thought, obviously wrong, that I knew her inside and out, and someday we would grow old together. But the fact that she was bisexual wasn't even a blip on the radar compared to the anger. I felt that she was obviously cheating on me. Another man, woman, it didn't make any difference. She gave her love to someone else. And this is not what we promised each other many years ago when she accepted my ring. It was an eternity. For eternity, it had to be timeless. Who knew that some eternities have an expiration date? I paid the bill, got into the car, and drove slowly home. I had a lot to figure out. Tracy did not expect me to return home one day early after the trip, but I was lucky and was able to resolve all issues ahead of schedule. So I headed home on Friday evening, rather than Saturday afternoon as originally planned. I'd been gone since Monday morning, and not only was I missing Tracy and the kids, but Tracy and I hadn't gone more than three days in a row without sex. So I was feeling some pent-up energy that needed to be released, at least until I saw what happened in the restaurant. I was an hour away from our hometown, and I could have easily just driven straight through. But since I was ahead of schedule, I was just going to go out to dinner to take a break from driving. And the rest, as they say, is history. Our kids are 12 and 10, so they were old enough to be left alone for the evening if Tracy wanted to go out, so I had no problem with that. However, I wondered if they knew what was going on, because neither of them ever told me that Tracy was doing anything different. Maybe they were as dark as I was, I thought. Either way, I knew they wouldn't be happy with what happened next. Yes, on the way home I did the usual self-analysis. What did I do wrong? How long did it last? Etc. At least I didn't have to worry about her lover having a bigger manhood than me, chuckling. I'm talking about myself, gallows humor. I walked in the door at nine, and Tracy still wasn't home. My daughters, Lisa, 12, and Ariel, 10, gave me a big happy greeting. And I watched, but didn't see them nervous or doubtful that I would be home early. That wasn't the case for Tracy when she walked in about two hours later. She apparently saw my car in the garage and cleaned it herself up a little because I noticed that about two minutes passing from the moment, the garage door opened until Tracy appeared in the kitchen, looking not as happy as last time. Times I saw her, what are you doing here today? I thought the trip wouldn't end until Saturday. She asked me first thing with a slightly worried expression on her face. Well, I'm glad to see you too, I said, making a big deal of her greeting. Well, if I had known you would be home early, I would have cooked you a nice dinner, she continued, as I saw the vein in her forehead twitch slightly.
I ordered pizza for the kids, and Kate and I just grabbed wine and sandwiches downtown. Do you remember Kate from my office? Did I tell you about her before? She didn't look me in the eye when she lied to my face. Yes, you talked about her before. Blonde with big breasts. A whole string of guys falls on her. That's for sure, Tracy said. I swear this woman could get a football team just by walking into a room. And not only since she makes a married woman arouse, I thought to myself, Kate was a beauty and had the breasts of a goddess. She was about 26 years old and started working at the insurance company where Tracy had worked the previous year. The two became instant friends and apparently somewhere down the line. At 39 years old, Tracy could still turn more than a few heads. She was also blonde, with a beautiful figure and curves in all the right places. She was only 10 pounds heavier than when we first met, but it was still a great package and at least until recently, it was exclusively my package. Despite the worried expression on her face, Tracy acted calmly. As for me, I could barely stand on my feet, so I just told her that I was tired and was going to bed. She gave me a quick peck on the lips as I walked past her and headed up the stairs. Perhaps I was mistaken, but I was almost sure that I felt the taste of sexual games on her lips. I went to bed, but did not fall asleep. The kids went to bed before me. So when I heard a quiet conversation a few minutes later, I realized Tracy was talking to Kate on the phone. It was a short conversation, and a few minutes later, I heard Tracy getting into the shower in our master bathroom. Either I scared her so much that she quit the game and wasn't as careful as before, or she thought I was dreaming and wouldn't find out about it. My heart sank even lower. Between kid stuff and housework, I didn't have to interact with Tracy too much for the rest of the weekend. She wanted to have a family dinner on Saturday night, but I said I wasn't in the mood and just left the room. Effectively ending the conversation, she must have known something was up because I'm rarely rude to her. On Monday morning at work, I asked my boss for the day off due to some personal issues I was having. John had been divorced about 10 years ago and remarried about 5 years ago, so he at least had an idea that something was wrong in the Mason family. Considering how well my sales trip had gone last week, he didn't even flinch when I asked for time off. But as I was about to leave his office, he handed me his business card. It was his divorce lawyer's card. I'm really sorry, Ron. I always thought you and Tracy were a good couple and were going to grow old together, he said. Yes, I thought so too, I answered. With my boss as a recommendation, I saw a lawyer two days later. Although she could have been much more businesslike, as she had probably done this several hundred times, she was very concerned about my feelings and guided me gently. She was surprised when I said I didn't want to hire a private investigator to get hard evidence that Tracy was cheating. I saw the light in her eyes, I told the lawyer. Besides, since it's a no-fault state, there doesn't seem to be much reason. The only real problem that could be is that she will be hard on visiting girls, but I'm pretty sure that won't happen. No matter how hard I tried, I just didn't have it in me to be around Tracy and the girls when I was home. Tracy obviously guessed this, probably because we barely talked. I think the girls knew something was going on by how quiet we were. I gave Tracy every opportunity to talk, but she never took it. Shit hit the fan when Tracy was serviced at work the following week. Call it petty of me if you like, but I wanted Tracy to feel even a fraction of the pain that I felt. I'm guessing she was served at 11.3 a.m., because at 11.05, me if you like, but I wanted Tracy to feel even a fraction of the pain that I felt. I'm guessing she was served at 11.3 a.m., because at 11.05 my phone started blowing up. I ignored all 15 calls from her, then ignored several from unfamiliar phones, thinking that she was trying to contact me by borrowing friends' phones. Surprisingly, I felt energized for the first time since I caught her and Kate, and I was having a really good day. Tracy's car was already in its place in the garage when I arrived at 5.30. She announced her presence quite quickly. You sneaky bastard. You don't even have the courage to face me, but you served me in front of my friends and colleagues. Tracy shouted at me as soon as I turned off the engine of my car. I didn't say a word until I entered the house and put my things down. The girls were in the living room, judging by the sounds coming from the big screen. I thought I was very attentive. 
I wanted to make sure you were served next to your mistress so she could comfort you, I said calmly. All the anger disappeared from her face and tears flowed. Do you know about Kate? But how could you? Ha how? We were so careful. Apparently, they are not careful enough, I replied. Just tell me two things. How long and when were you planning to tell me? Maybe six months, she squeaked. We were going to tell you soon, very soon. In less than 30 seconds, Tracy's attitude went from venomous to punch in the gut. She staggered over to the kitchen table and sat down on a chair. I walked over to the drinks cabinet above the refrigerator and grabbed a bottle of Buffalo Trace bourbon. I poured myself a double drink and sat down in the chair opposite her. If looks could kill, she would have died within the first two seconds. I looked at her. For her part, she could not take her eyes off the table. How could I not know you were bisexual after all this time? I asked quietly. Because until recently I didn't know myself, she answered. I just learned about it little by little. I swear to you, this wasn't planned. It just happened. Finally, she looked at me and held my gaze. This shouldn't change anything for you, Srani. I still love you as much as before. There's just another side of me that I need to explore. If you love me as much as you always say you will, you will support me and give me more time to explore this, Tracy said. It's my turn. Damn, I was shocked. Are you saying that six months was not enough for research? I snorted. If you really love me, you would remember our vows and not explore at all. I thought fidelity had nothing to do with gender. But what if I didn't succeed? She whined that I wouldn't have her or you. Perhaps you should have thought about this before your first trip. Why the fuck should I volunteer to be your backup plan? Because you love me, remember? Love, true love, must be able to forgive a mistake, she said. Once is a mistake, Tracy. Six months is a conscious decision. What world do you live in? And yes, I really love you. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen overnight. But my love for you does not give you the pincers to tear out my heart and destroy our family. Wait, this has nothing to do with girls. You self-centered bitch, I shouted. This has a lot to do with girls. They will have their entire lives ruined because you decided that you needed to explore another woman's private parts. Well, I never thought you'd be such a whiner about this, she shouted back to me. No, you never thought I would catch you so you could take your time and figure out what your plan would be. You turned into a piece of shit right before my eyes. And no, Tracy, you don't love me as much as you used to. I saw the way you look at her. You love her the same way you used to love me, body and soul. It's easy to notice. You may still love me, but it's clear to me that I've fallen to second place. You may love me like a pet, but you don't love me like a man anymore. However, you are very much in love with her. That's not true, Ronnie. I stop it, Tracy. I yelled at her. I'm not a fool, and I know what I saw. I know you better than any other living person, and I know what I was looking at. She had the tact to look guilty. Then the light came on. Have you seen us together? My God, that's it. But Ronnie, this doesn't have to be the end of us, she said quickly. It doesn't look like there's another man involved. This is completely different. No, it's not completely different. You love someone else instead of me. That's the point. And perhaps everything would have been different if it had been another man. At least then I could punch your lover in the face, I said. Can we at least be polite, she asked. Honestly, I don't know, I answered quietly. She may be a beautiful young woman, but she is still your mistress and she stole my wife. The ugly facts don't change because you decide to fall in love with a woman. A few months later, I learned that the children knew nothing about Tracy's affair. They thought that Aunt Kate was just a close friend of Mom's. They had both seen the occasional quick kiss and gentle touch. But since Aunt Kate wasn't a man, they didn't think there was anything inappropriate. I found out about this one night when the kids and I went out to dinner, and the kids mentioned that Kate had been spending more time in the house since I moved in. They seemed to have figured out that Aunt Kate was one of the reasons Tracy and I were getting a divorce. Since we live in a no-fault divorce state, our finances were pretty much split down the middle. I had to pay her child support. She got the house until the kids went to college, and of course I had to pay child support. I moved into an apartment about 15 minutes from my old home. I was completely crushed. 
Tracy and I kept in touch through the girls. They were involved in all sorts of activities, both in and out of school. And Tracy and I tried our best to show them that we were going to support them as much as possible. I don't know why, but Tracy fought hard with the divorce, and it dragged on for a year before we finally did it. I was polite, nothing more, when I ran into Tracy and Kate at my daughter's parties. As for family events, I was always invited, but knowing that Tracy would be there, I apologized and asked for forgiveness. I know I was giving up some wonderful family memories, but it took everything I had to keep my compass sore when she and Kate were around. I did a solo day for the kids to give them birthday and Christmas gifts. As you might expect, each of us retained the friends we had before we got married. Almost all the friends we made after we got married stayed with Tracy. As one of the husbands explained to me, many of them felt awkward around me, given that I had lost my wife to a woman. The consensus seemed to be that I somehow deserved it, and several of our married women friends almost made just that claim. I let them go without a fight, because as the old saying goes, you learn who your real friends are under adverse conditions. By my own choice, I didn't date much for the next few years. My heart certainly wasn't ready for this, and I didn't need much communication. After a year of being alone, I went to the local animal shelter and adopted a German shepherd, who was probably about three years old. I actually went to the shelter and asked them to show me the three dogs that had been there the longest. The one I chose had been there since he was a frisky puppy. But after being rejected repeatedly, he turned into a quiet, reclusive animal with the saddest pair of eyes I've ever seen on an animal. I felt like we were soulmates because we were both rejected. The dog's name was Bob, not some cute animal name or something named after a cute Disney character, just Bob. Bob caught me and I caught Bob. The first thing he did when I brought him into my apartment after sniffing around was to climb onto the couch next to me and curl up next to me. He was good with the girls when I had them over on the weekends, but I think Bob liked it best when it was just us guys. He loved to walk or ride with me, and we could talk about almost any topic. Admittedly, Bob was mostly silent during these conversations, but I knew from the look on his face and ears that he was paying attention to everything I said. A few years later, my oldest daughter Lisa met a guy from Boston in college and got married. Since I was doing pretty well in my engineering career, I could afford to give her the wedding of her dreams. I couldn't have been more proud of her as I walked her down the aisle, but after the service, I earned a reprimand from her for ruining my one line. I realized this right during the rehearsal, but under the pressure of the real situation, my voice cracked. And when I came to my senses, I answered the question of who is marrying this woman off with I, instead of the correct line, her mother and I. Hey, I almost choked, so sue me. When I got to my seat in the front row next to Tracy, she leaned towards me and said quietly, it was disgusting, and you know it. Kate then leaned forward from her seat next to Tracy and actually had the nerve to glare at me. I have to admit, it was a good frown. Fuck you, bitch, I told her with just my lips, looking to see if the pastor was looking in our direction. Wedding ceremonies always bring back memories for me, and at first I looked back on my wedding day fondly. This memory lasted about 30 seconds before I mentally pictured Tracy and Kate together in the restaurant when I found out about them. When I awoke from my reverie, Tracy was looking at me sadly. She blushed and quickly looked away. I guess I wasn't the only one taking a walk down memory lane. Although I didn't try to watch, I noticed that Tracy and Kate seemed to be having a great time together with Lisa and her new husband Jerry and almost everyone else. It was then that I noticed that I was one of the few single people over 50 in the room. I felt sorry for myself, so I went to the open bar and ordered a shot of 18-year-old Irish whiskey. I took my glass, sat down at my table, and quietly patted myself on the back for hosting such a grand event. Three years later, I was about to play the father of the bride again when my youngest, Ariel, had her bow walk her down the aisle. I decided not to go it alone this time, so I knew I had to finally get off my ass and make a concerted effort to meet people. Three weeks later, I was returning home from a three-day trip out of state and stopped at a small bar restaurant about an hour from my apartment. I usually stay away from these types of bars because I hate country western music but they were advertising pork BBQ, so I just had to stop.
The food was great, and there was a decent crowd there. When the DJ starts playing music around 8 p.m., I was looking around just in case there might be someone worth chatting with, so to speak. Just then, a 30-year-old black woman with the face of an angel walked through the door. I mean, she was absolutely gorgeous, but I had to wonder why an unmarried young black woman was at the bar at this time. On the other hand, that the lonely old white guy was here too. I knew she was probably too young for me, but damn it, I motioned to the bartender to put everything she drank on my tab. He told her that her drink was paid for and gestured in my direction, and she walked over to my table to thank me. I invited her to sit down and to my surprise, she sat down next to me and introduced herself as Jade. We were having a nice evening when she asked me if I would like to go to her place. Hell yeah, I was surprised, but hey, you never turn down an invitation like that from a gorgeous woman. So we were almost at the door when a man in a cowboy hat walked up to Jade and lightly kissed her on the cheek. I stopped abruptly. It's okay, Ron. This is my husband, Fred. He's just going to have a look. I hope you don't so, Kate Ron. This is my husband, Fred. He's just going to have a look. I hope you don't mind, she asked. Fred gave me a white-toothed smile. It's okay, dude. We are involved in this. He kind of laughed at me. There's something wrong with me, dude, I snapped back. Damn, this generation is so fucked up. I raised my hands to stop them both and then walked out to my car alone. My next attempt to find a woman was through my church. Carrie and I got along pretty well and went on a few dates. She was a 50-year-old divorcee with long black hair, 34 B breasts, long legs, and a big smile. I started to get a good feeling about this. And on our fourth date, we went back to my apartment and my bed. Fifteen minutes later, I was giving her affection, and she was screaming with all her might. During the third climax, she began to mutter, and during the fifth, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Hell yes, Jim, Jim, Jim. Yes, Jim is her ex-husband's name. I stopped immediately. When she finally recovered from her climax, she looked at me with genuine anger on her face. Why the fuck did you just stop? She yelled at me. Because I'm not your fucking ex-husband, you stupid bitch. I silently drove her home. Needless to say, there was no fifth date. For my next dating adventure, I invited a co-worker over for an evening of food and dancing. Allison Webb was a 42-year-old divorcee who separated from her husband almost five years ago. She was a vivacious blonde with slightly larger breasts and butt than someone of average proportions, and we were friends at work for about 10 years. By this point, she had already heard my sad story, and I had heard hers. We had a great evening, and it turned into some great evenings. We really enjoyed each other's company, and this was even before we had sex for the first time. I knew we would have a great time at the wedding, so I asked if she would be my date. Do you want me to be your date at your daughter's wedding? Family, ex-wife, I'm not sure I can handle this, Allison said seriously. Well, that's pervaded you get the green light from Bob first, I added. Who is Bob? She asked, puzzled. Bob is my wingman, I answered. My best friend in the whole world, a 45-pound German shepherd mix with a very sophisticated taste. If he doesn't like you, he shouldn't accompany me to the wedding. You're a strange person, Ron, she replied. Allison passed Bob's test the following week and agreed to be my wedding date. The girls seemed very happy that I would not be performing solo for the occasion. For some reason, Tracy seemed to have a problem with this, giving me face every time she looked at me. Since I barely talked to her, I didn't care what she thought, but it bothered Allison, who immediately sensed Tracy's dislike for her. What's your problem, Tracy? I finally asked her when I found her alone at the rehearsal dinner. Do you really need to ask? Are you dating Girl Scouts? What's next? Whoa, jealousy definitely didn't look good on Tracy. Actually, Tracy, Hallison are the same age as Kate. I haven't forgotten that you traded me for a younger female version. At least Tracy had the grace to look shy. A year later, Allison became my second wife, and life went on. To tell you the truth, I had completely forgotten that I was on the bone marrow registry when I got a call one day at work and was told that after 30 years, I was a match for someone.
I have to admit, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to help save someone's life. I knew that the bone marrow extraction would be somewhat inconvenient, but I've always had this hero complex and was more than willing to put up with the procedure. There was some further testing to be done, and if it was good, then the extraction would be scheduled for two weeks after that. I gave my consent and told them I was on board. I'm not a very religious person, but I believe in God. And there is an old saying that God works in mysterious ways. I never thought about it until four days later when I spoke on the phone with my oldest daughter Lisa during our weekly conversation. Ariel and I don't talk about their mother Tracy and her life, but for some reason Lisa mentioned that bone marrow had been found for Aunt Kate and that she and Tracy were very involved. I mentioned to Lisa that I didn't know anything was wrong with Kate, and she filled me in on the details of Kate's year-long battle with leukemia. I told my daughter to give my best wishes to Kate and Tracy, because although I will never recover from what they did to me, I did not wish them harm. You know, Dad, you are an adult. You can call them and tell them yourself, Lisa warned. You're right, baby, but the less I talk to them, the less likely I am to say something unpleasant which I may or may not regret later, I answered honestly. Dad, you've been divorced for 16 years. Finally come to terms with it, she said. You've been married to Allison for almost two years. You always tell me that you are happy. I'm happy, baby, but the pain of betraying your mother will never go away. I don't hate her anymore, but she's definitely not on my Facebook friends list. I'll tell you what, I'll send her flowers with a card of good wishes. This is fine. At least it would be right, she said. I didn't think much more about it until I called my local florist and ordered a bouquet of flowers and a get well card. As I was talking to the florist, a thought suddenly struck me. Bone marrow matches are quite rare. And the fact that I was a coincidence and Kate found a match at almost the same time seemed too coincidental. The donation process is entirely based on anonymity so I knew I wouldn't get a straight answer from the people at the bone marrow registry, unless I was really mean. So I called my contact at the registry, sounding very optimistic, and asked her how likely it was that my date and I lived in the same city. She stuttered when she asked how I knew who was right for me, so I kinda lied. People talk, and we seem to have children together, I answered. This is the first time, she admitted. Mnum. I muttered as my brain began to overload. Damn it, I was going to give that bitch some bone marrow. She steals my wife. Neither of them ever say sorry to me. All I hear from them is, hey, kiss my ass, and I'm going to save her life by donating her bone marrow. It will not happen. Two days later, I called my receptionist back and said I was refusing to make the donation. She almost burst into tears, and when she came to her senses, she asked me if there was any specific reason why I backed down. She explained that although I had the right to refuse, this was almost never done and would cause great consternation at the registry. I apologized for causing horror, but told her it was in my own best interest to refuse. She muttered that she was sorry, and told me that if I changed my mind in the very near future, I should call her. Allison was furious when I told her I had turned down the donation. I didn't tell her that I found out who the donation was supposed to go to. She just knew that I had abandoned the obligation to possibly save someone's life. What the hell is wrong with you? My wife practically screamed at me. You always said you wanted to do this. But now that it's here, you want to ruin someone's life. This was the first time I heard Allison drop an F-bomb. I knew she was obsessed with nuclear weapons. I decided that I had better be honest with her. She was not impressed by my reasoning. Would you really deny this woman a chance at life to take revenge? Please tell me it's not true, she shouted at me. It's not really revenge, I said. I wouldn't have told her or my ex-wife what time it was if I had a watch. But they didn't. They both fucked me, and I tried to have as little in common with them as possible. Why should I change now, just because Kate is dying? I'm the injured party here, so none of them know it was you. Allison asked. Everything is done anonymously. I only found out about this by luck. Allison's face softened. Ronnie, you can't refuse this. You hold this woman's life in your hands. It would be wrong if you could have helped but didn't, she practically whispered. You're too nice a guy to do that. You know that sooner or later the guilt will consume you. 
No, Ellie. I don't think I'll feel guilty. Kate broke my heart and Tracy went along with it. Besides, they'll never know it's me. But Ronnie, they had such hope. And now you've probably ruined them completely. Allison and I bullied each other for a few more days, and it seemed like we were growing further apart as a couple. We have never disagreed as much as we do now. Where is your Christian charity, Ronnie? She asked me at one point. So if a beggar comes to me and asks for money to buy bullets to shoot me, I should just blindly dig into my pocket, I asked. Now you're just ridiculous, she shouted to me. They didn't tear out your heart and turn your world upside down, I told her. So now I should just shrug it off and help them. It's been 17 years already. Tracy was married to Kate longer than she was to you. Deal with it. They made a decision, I answered quietly. They can live or not, whatever with this decision. I left the room. A few days later, on a Saturday afternoon, I told Allison I was going to the range to blow off some steam. Make sure you're back well before dinner. The girls are coming, and I don't want you to smell like gunpowder, so you need to take a shower before we eat, she told me. I knocked the living crap out of the target with 500 rounds from my 9mm whitefish. I can't explain why, but shooting always relaxes me. I think it's because you have to really concentrate on what you're doing, and when you stop concentrating so hard, your body goes into a relaxed mode. At least that's my thought, and I stand by it. I definitely smelled like gunpowder when I got home, so when I got home, I quickly headed to the shower. I glanced at the dining table, there was set for six people, and from the smell, Allison was cooking a roast. She is a great cook, and I was hoping she would make these little brown potatoes instead of mashed potatoes. After taking a shower, I poured myself a glass of rye whiskey and brought Ellie a glass of wine. She seemed a little nervous, which I put down to her wanting the dinner to be perfect for the girls and their husbands. I kissed her on the lips. I was sitting in the living room reading on the computer when the door opened and the girls came in, not accompanied by their husbands, but by Tracy and a shabby-looking Kate. I wasn't happy to see any of them, and I shot Allison a glare as I stood up to greet everyone. I kissed both girls, but didn't say anything to my ex or Kate. I noticed that they greeted Allison with what could be called enthusiasm. There seemed to be a lot of whispering around. Not having been born yesterday, I immediately knew that Allison had orchestrated this little intervention. I was more inclined to think of it as an ambush, since apparently I was the only one unaware of the meeting. I thought about just taking my phone and leaving, but then I decided it was time for me to speak up. At first, however, I had to endure the excuse that it was just a nice meal with family and friends. Kate's illness was the main topic of conversation at the table, although I took no part in it, sitting with what I thought was a thoughtful expression on my face. I suppose dinner and dessert were good. I really couldn't tell. Being the good host I am, I gave everyone their afternoon drinks, and we moved into the living room. There was silence for a moment, and I decided that now was a good time to start the show. So who will speak first? The woman who betrayed my trust to set up this meeting? Or the woman who tore my heart out all those years ago, but now thinks I owe her a favor? Or maybe we should hear from a woman who stole a married woman from her unsuspecting, loving husband, but now, in the cruelest turn of events, needs that cuckold for a chance at life? As I made my statement, I looked from one face to another. None of the women could answer my gaze. Allison looked very excited when I called her name. My eldest daughter Lisa had to start. Since I didn't mention either of the daughters, they may have assumed that I would cut them the most slack. Look, Dad, we all understand that you're still mad at Mom and Aunt Kate, but refusing to donate a bone marrow is childish petty and beneath you, she said. You will get your greatest revenge without helping someone live, but that's just crap. We're talking about a person's life, Dad, not about hitting someone in the face with a whipped cream pie. Terminate a person's life for revenge. I took a sip of rye whiskey, then cleared my throat. I shook my head slightly. Have any of you even looked at this from my point of view for a second? I trembled with anger. Every action in life has consequences. Now I know that Tracy and Kate never expected these consequences to be so severe, but it is their problem that they are now trying to make my problem. 
Who knew that one day I would have a real chance to make a difference in the life of someone who did me wrong? You all think it's because of revenge, and maybe I'll get some self-respect back. After all, how much self-respect could I have if I helped the man who stole my wife survive? And I don't think any of you even consider the fact that you think I should be easier on Kate because she's a woman. If her name was Carl and he was a 200-pound man, most of you would probably think that I would be right about what I do. But it doesn't matter to me that Kate is a woman. She's a wife, stealing bitch. She knew what she was doing was wrong. Kate tried to drill a hole in the carpet with her eyes. Sitting next to her on our couch, Tracy reached over and squeezed Kate's hand. This is not revenge. This is hatred. I hate her. And while I don't wish her any harm, I have no intention of helping her in any way, in any situation. In case you weren't paying attention, I barely spoke to her in the 17 years she was with Tracy. Tracy sniffled, holding back tears. Do you really hate me so much that you could deprive another person of their chance to live? If you ever love me as much as you say, wouldn't you consider it a noble thing to do? This is a matter of honor. That's good coming from you, I spat. I loved you as much as I said I would, but hate is just a short step from love, especially love that is despised. You are a slut, and you have no right to tell me what honor is. My volume level rose, and I tried my best not to tell them all, including Allison, to burn in hell and leave me alone. I took a couple of deep breaths, and Allison apparently decided that I wasn't angry enough with her. Ronnie, you are a good person. You always do the right thing, she said quietly. You know that retreating is wrong. You'll never be able to live with yourself if you do that. Come on, Dad, you taught Ariel and I to always do the right thing. Even if it seems wrong, Lisa interjected. That's right, baby, this is for me. I won't have any regrets. I won't lose a minute of sleep. Please, please say, Kate, I suddenly exclaimed. I know that I offended you greatly, but I don't want to die. And the doctors say my chances are slim unless you donate your bone marrow. Kate's eyes looked haunted. Asking me to help save her life must have been the hardest thing she's ever done. I looked deep into those haunted ease. I did not feel the joy of confirming my decision, but I confirmed it. No, that's all I said. I didn't say the phrasey I'm sorry, because frankly, I wasn't sorry. I won't do anything in my power to help this woman. Kate took my answer better than Tracy, who burst into tears. Allison walked over to the couple to calm them down, and I heard her whisper, I'll try, I'll talk to him. She was so caught up in the moment that Allison never realized that she had put our marriage in G party. I will have to think long and hard about whether I can bridge the gap in our trust. I grabbed the car keys from the key ring where they were located. I walked out the door while five women cried. I didn't return for three days. I didn't answer any of the dozens of phone calls from Allison or the kids. The house was dark. I quickly looked around and decided that Allison had stopped somewhere else for the time being. A suitcase and some clothes were missing, but almost everything else was left untouched. I also grabbed my suitcase and packed a few things, taking most of my clothes and most of my belongings with me. I'd left my wedding ring in the middle of the kitchen table. Three days later at work, I received a call from someone who did not tell our secretary his name. I assumed Allison had forced me to answer her call, and I was right. Really? You're telling me it's over between us because I tried to get you to not be the biggest asshole in the world. I can't believe I married a man who let someone die to get revenge. You just suck. Well, I can't believe I married a woman who violated my trust so completely. But you know what? We can both fix it, I replied. And if someone takes revenge, it's not me. This is God. Remember the old biblical saying, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. What better way of revenge than to give a potential life-saving cure to the person who hates sufferers the most? You really suck. You know that? Kate died two months after the official divorce. I read the obituary in our local newspaper. I didn't follow her case, and no one kept me informed. In fact, none of. My daughter spoke to me after the ambush. I love my children, but you have to stand up for what you believe in. And neither I nor my girls back down because of my stance on not helping Kate. My decision was the right one for me. I never lost a minute of sleep over not giving Kate my bone marrow. 
The people at the bone marrow registry were not very understanding of my individual situation and completely crossed me off the list. I was fine with this because the likelihood of me getting a second match was extremely unlikely. Bob was a bit moody and not exactly thrilled with any of the women I'd brought home over the past year or so. But that was okay because at 62, I wasn't really looking for wife number three. Somewhat surprisingly, I was still getting my share of good sex. I learned that at that age, eligible women outnumbered eligible men, about four to one. And if her health was good, there was a good chance my girlfriend was ready for a role in the hay for the evening. Of course, we couldn't frolic with too much youth. After all, neither of us wanted to break a hip. But more often than not, we both enjoyed a nice roll in the hay. I jokingly called my ladies my sexy old singletons. I hadn't spoken to anyone in my family for over four years when my youngest Ariel called to tell me that Tracy had died a few days ago. She thought I should know and invited me to the funeral. We had 15 good years together and had two kids, so I figured I should at least show up. Maybe I can improve my relationship with the girls. I sat in the back alone. It was a good ceremony. After the funeral, I approached the girls and their families. I received shy hugs from the girls, firm handshakes from their husbands, and shy greetings from my three grandchildren. We went to a nearby restaurant to talk. About three minutes passed before the first salvo was fired. This came from Lisa. So tell me again why you let Aunt Kate die, she said out of nowhere. I see that nothing has changed, I answered. Four years, and we're back with this wife thief bitch. Fine, last time, and I mean the last time. Jerry, look at that handsome young guy at the bar, I said, pointing my head towards the 20-year-old blonde guy with blue eyes. What if he comes here and kisses Lisa with a big wet kiss? What would you do? I would have turned off his lights, he said without hesitation. Right, now what would you do if you caught him having an affair with Lisa? He would already be dead. True again, but since he would be dead, you wouldn't have to worry about donating bone marrow if he got sick, would you? No, perhaps not. That's exactly what I meant, I said. I didn't kill Kate, partly because she was a woman. This is probably my mistake, but I still shouldn't have saved the life of the man who was having an affair with my wife or who completely stole it, should I? No, you shouldn't, Jerry said as the light came on above his head. He slowly looked around the room, looking at every face. Little by little, the light of understanding lit up in each pair of eyes. I'm not proud of my decision, but I'm not ashamed of it either, I said quietly. That bitch stole the love of my life and didn't deserve my compassion. But if you ever loved your mother, how could you, asked Ariel. I loved your mother with every fiber of my being and when she broke my heart. Well, most of that love turned to hate. I'm sorry, I'm just a person, but I'm not the monster she made you think I was, just a man. Things just didn't turn out well for your mother. Karma bitch finally caught up with her and her fucking friend. The other four adults in the room had tears in their eyes. The children looked confused and worried. I understand that this will take time for all of us. How about we don't remember this anymore? Life goes on. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.